All right, it's um, two o'clock, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome, everybody. My name is Stacey Matrazo. I'm the executive director of the Florida Wildflower Foundation. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Butterflies of Florida. For those of you not familiar with our organization, our mission is to protect, connect, and expand native wildflower habitats through education, research, planting, and conservation programs. Our work is made possible primarily through the sale and renewal of the state wildflower license plate. This is our old look. We had this for almost 20 years. Now we have this beautiful new design. Whether you have the old or the new design, you are supporting our work and we appreciate it. The funds from the license plate sale and renewal, as well as donations and memberships support and uh, support the projects that we do. They help us build awareness and knowledge of native wildflowers and plants throughout Florida. We'd like to encourage those of you who find our programs valuable to consider becoming a member, making a donation, or getting the state wildflower license plate. And if you purchase the plate, uh, let us know. You're eligible for membership benefits as well. So you just need to uh, give, shoot an email to us and we will get you set up. Be sure to check out our website for resources on planting and growing wildflowers, to learn uh, where to see wildflowers in bloom, upcoming events, and more. We're also on social media. You can find us on most platforms at FLA Wildflowers. Uh, next month, we will be um, hosting Laura Langlois Lang Zero, founder of the Florida Native Bees Facebook group, and she will be speaking on native bees in winter. She is a conservation photographer and, um, again, founder of a very popular Facebook group. So join us for that on Wednesday, December 14th. You can register for that on our website. Um, in January, we've got an excellent uh, presentation on foraging. So be sure to, um, again, check out our website for more information. Um, of course, we have field trips every month as well. In December, we are hosting our annual Christmas tree cut cutting event. Um, so uh, that'll be on December 3rd. You can visit our website for more information and learn how to uh, sign up and get the permit you need in order to cut down that tree. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. All attendees are muted with cameras off. If you have questions, please use the Q&A feature. You can type your question in at any point during the presentation, and we will um, address those questions at the end. Um, time permitting. Um, you're also able to email your questions to us if we don't get to them, and we will make sure that um, our presenter has them to give you an answer. Um, the webinar is being recorded, and it will be available on our YouTube channel and our website in about 24 to 48 hours. Everyone who registered will also receive an email from us with a link to the recording, as well as some resources and uh, links to our speakers. Um, websites as well. So keep an eye out for that in your inbox. And now I'd like to introduce our speaker. Anita Camacho is a lifelong Floridian from the Tampa Bay area. She's the owner of Little Red Wagon Native Nursery and president and founder of the Tampa Bay Butterfly Foundation and North American Butterfly Association Tampa Bay Chapter. These entities work together to conserve butterflies, monitor their populations, and restore their habitats as well as educate the public about the importance of Florida ecosystems. Anita opened Little Red Wagon Nursery, Native Nursery, excuse me, in South Tampa in uh, April of 2020. And it is the only native nursery, uh, native plant nursery currently in Hillsborough County. So if you're looking for native plants and you're in that area, be sure to check that out. Um, Anita works with multiple universities on studies for the advancement of science on the monarch butterfly. She also leads many butterfly population counts throughout Florida and offers education, outreach, and butterfly talks for numerous groups of all ages to raise awareness of the plight of our environment and the importance of native plants and insects. Without further ado, I will uh, stop sharing my screen and hand it over to you, Anita. All right. Okay. 
Uh, well, thank you, um, Stacy and, and Rose, for the invite today to uh, to speak to everyone uh, and spread the word um, a little bit more about our Florida butterflies and the native plants they rely on. Um, just a little bit more about our organizations. Um, we're currently uh, working on opening a butterfly conservatory in Tampa behind our nursery, a small facility that'll highlight uh, the Florida native species of butterflies and some moths. And um, we, as Stacy mentioned, we opened Little Red Wagon Nursery in April of 2020 during the shutdown, pandemic shutdown, and um, currently still the only native nursery in Hillsborough County. So um, both of those entities, uh, the proceeds go to Tampa Bay Butterfly Foundation to continue our work with uh, researchers and also putting more real Florida back into Florida and conservation efforts of conserving the butter butterflies and, and putting in more of the habitat that they desperately need uh, and, a, and a lot of education components as well. And I'm a member of uh, many different organizations, both locally and worldwide. And uh, very, very proud to be here with Florida Wildflower Foundation today and supporting that group. And without wildflowers, we would not have butterflies and a lot of other things. So pretty important uh, relationship between butterflies and uh, wildflowers here. So some of the projects we've worked on uh, locally, we've done uh, quite a lot of work with Center for Conservation with Florida Aquarium, Florida Fish and Wildlife in Tico. It's a 20 acre property in Apollo Beach. So if you ever may get down to the Manatee Viewing Center in the winter months to see the manatees, the property is adjacent to that. And we have a pollinator garden there. Um, and Florida Aquarium has their coral re respawning center, uh, the turtle research and surgery center. and uh, Florida Fish and Wildlife has a youth center as well as a fishery. So there's quite a few interesting things there. Um, and we did kind of the land component and planted a lot of native plants actually just before the shutdown. And one of the fascinating uh, parts about that project was that we planted January, February, March, three different plantings around the property. And then the shutdown happened a week after our last planting in March. And uh, it was very nerve wracking because we couldn't go on the property to maintain the plants and get them established. And it was drought time of year, of course. And um, then they had to let go of their grounds crew. And uh, there were only two people maintaining the 20 acre part, uh, park there um, with four buildings. So it was, um, it was a little scary because you know we had a big investment with them. And finally, after we go through the heat of the summer, all the drought time of year, rainy season, we got to go out there in August, several months later. And I was pleasantly surprised that we only lost one plant out of 2000 that were planted. So um, that really says a lot about the uh, viability of native plants and, and how they can really um, survive here in Florida. And listed there are several other projects that we're involved in. We also do a lot of work with locally with USF and internships and uh, with their environmental science students. So we've been uh, very lucky to actually hire three of the, the environmental students uh, to work with us here. So that's been kind of a neat program. So this is um, behind the nursery when we first uh, moved in. It was actually the whole building, everything was in pretty bad disrepair, but this is a, a little um, service road behind the nursery. And this is known in the garden world to be a hell strip because there's just this little tiny strip of land on each side of the road, or it could be between sidewalks and streets that is very difficult sometimes to get things to grow or they're very ignored pieces of land. And while they're tiny, they still can be mighty and produce an awful lot of uh, habitat opportunities. So this was actually, someone had weed whacked it and uh, we picked up the litter and we were picking up probably five or six five gallon buckets of litter behind the nursery every single day. Uh, it was a, definitely people driving through saying, oh, well, this is where we put our trash and everyone's throwing trash out the window. So I said, well, let's plant it up. Let's give something for the pollinators and it can be kind of a demonstration garden for native plants. So we did that and put in some signage. And this was the garden about three months after we planted it. And the interesting uh, beneficial side effect, not to mention the uptick in pollinators, was that people stopped throwing litter out the window. And we very rarely have much to pick up out there all week long anymore. So that was, um, that was kind of a cool effect that, that this garden had. Um, but we now notice a lot of people walking through there with their dogs and their kids in strollers and showing them the butterflies because there's an awful lot of butterflies um, flying around back there all the time now. So we went from a, maybe one or two species of butterflies that I found at the nursery when we first moved here um, to now there's about 25 or more. So 
it's a pretty cool little project. And I know Stacy in her her recent talk talked about you know some of this homegrown national park and and changing our habits habits with um, how we look at our our uh, landscapes. And it is really important um, to the extent you can shrink the lawn. I eliminated mine. I haven't missed it in 25 years. Um, I don't mind not having mowers, blowers, and edgers and all these things going on off in our yard all the time. Not to mention the expense of it. So shrinking a lawn can not only provide a lot of benefits for wildlife, but it, it also gives us a, our own little national park, so to speak, at home to kind of go out and see wildlife and see what's out there. And, and it's, it is a lot of fun. And funny enough, uh, I wish my neighbors would start to pick up on that idea because they love to come visit my yard with their kids because the front yard, backyard, side yard is all planted for natives. And uh, there's always a lot of things flying around there. So it's a big, it's a big initiative that Doug Tallamy started. Um, and east of the Mississippi, we know that 86% of the property is privately owned. So there's a really big opportunity to make a big difference. And every little pocket garden, a potted plant on a, on a balcony, everything makes a big difference that we do. So trying to detach ourselves from this concept of the, the, the lawn, the non-native lawn that's not serving a benefit and it serves even less when we start putting all these chemicals on it. And it's killing our pollinators and lots of other beneficial insects, which is the bottom of the food chain that's desperately needed for us. And we're at the top of the food chain. So rethinking this idea, um, I know with this plant on the left, it's known as dollar weed or pennywort, um, it, there's been a war against this plant since I can remember as a kid, um, you know, go to Home Depot, Lowe's or your native, you know, hardware store to pick up whatever you needed, whatever chemical they were prescribing to, to get rid of this plant. And the funny thing is that, that this plant is evergreen. It's a low grower. You don't have to mow it. Um, it has a cute little white flower. It's edible. And my, I'm a CPA by trade, so I find it interesting that both of their common names happen to have to do with money, being pennywort and dollarweed. So it seems to me there's a lot of value in this plant. And if we stopped fighting it, we would have a green lawn without trying. So there's a lot of beneficial things that, you know, we can take a look at and see what we can do to change the way we're looking at the plants that are growing here naturally. Um, and chemicals are a big, big issue. Uh, they're really affecting our health. Um, being that we're the top of the food chain, but it's affecting everything. We're not just killing a specific bug that we think shouldn't be here, and we don't know necessarily understand what its benefits are. But we just we we spray it random, and just um, it's an all been an all out war for many years, and very well advertised. The chemical companies have done a fantastic job promoting, you know, getting rid of anything that moves, essentially. But we know that we just, you know, we shouldn't just go to a net, have to go to a national park to see wildlife. So eliminating these toxic pesticides and chemicals from our landscape use is, is a, it's a pretty big responsibility that we have for our own health and the health of our environment to uh, make a difference and understanding, you know, what these insects do and how they provide for us ultimately in the food chain in between is kind of a, it's kind of a big deal. Um, so why native plants? Well, without native plants, they're not gonna have too many butterflies and pollinators that can survive. Many plants here locally in Florida, they, they're used to our sandy soil. That's where they evolve, they belong here. So we don't have to do anything fancy to make our soil okay for these, these uh, plants to grow. And they're a lot more, um, the roots go a lot deeper and they really help, um, help with runoff and a, and a lot of other environmental issues that we have in Florida. So without these plants, we're experiencing just a lot of damage to our state's ecosystems. And not to mention, we know that the water systems have become very unhealthy with fertilizers that uh, have banned um, the sale of fertilizers in most stores in the summer. Well, in all stores, it's not supposed to be sold. Some people still sell it. Um, to prevent this during rainy season, but it's, you know, these chemicals are getting into the ground, making their way out through our water systems into the Gulf and Atlantic and creating havoc with, with the wildlife and, you know, in the oceans and waterways, as well as red tide, which is a normal occurrence, a natural occurrence, but it's at a much higher level. These are all things that are happening with all these chemicals and um, it's affecting all, all of our wildlife. Native plants don't need all those chemicals, 
they do need pollinators. And while not all pollinators are as popular as a butterfly, perhaps, uh, they're all very important. Um, and one of the things that's quite interesting is that native palms, our saw palmetto and cabbage palm especially, that's the number one nectar source in Florida for our pollinators. It provides a ton of food for with the berries for small mammals and birds. And it's also a host plant for the cabbage palm or the cabbage moth, moth, excuse me. So there's an awful lot that this plant does and uh, having it in your landscape, not to mention leaving the fronds. So when even after they are brown uh, for habitat for small animals, as well as bats that, you know, will take care of our mosquito problem. So there's a, a very good um, plant that's number one and these plants are number one and uh, planting these will provide an awful lot for your, your home ecosystems. And then number two, uh, native citrus, this is wild lime. This one actually is a um, host plant for the giant swallowtail, the largest swallowtail in North America. Uh, doesn't really produce a fruit that's edible for us. It's a very teeny tiny fruit you see on the picture on the bottom left. It's about the size of a pinhead, but it's a, it's a very important plant, extremely thorny. Um, so if you wanna put it, produce a screen somewhere where you don't want certain things getting through, it's a very thorny plant, we'll do that. Um, our non-native citrus also provides um, a pretty significant resource for our pollinators as well. Um, although we know that the native citrus is having a significant issue with greening and other diseases since it really doesn't have the same defense mechanisms here as, uh, as it would where the plant is native to. And number three, this is actually probably one of my favorite plants um, and that kind of shocks a lot of people because they'll say, oh, it takes over my yard. And it, it is a very prolific seeder and it, and it will reseed all over the place. It sticks to your plants, little seeds stick to your dogs or, and animals, um, but that's also how it spreads and, and it is the number three nectar source in Florida. It's an edible herb, which some people know about and some people may not. Um, I use the flowers on my salads. They don't really have much flavor, but they look pretty. And it's a host plant for the Dainey sulfur butterfly. So it really has an awful lot to offer. And this was, I didn't realize this plant would actually grow on a fence, um, but it did wind its way up our fence here at the nursery. So I finished shaping it because it was starting to look kind of like a heart. So for Valentine's day, very timely, we shaped it like a heart and uh, had a really cute social media post. So gotta love this plant. It's a, it's a powerhouse for butterflies. And when we're doing our butterfly counts, year round, if you find this plant, you will typically find butterflies on it. So it's pretty important resource when other things aren't blooming, this one is since it's evergreen. So we'll talk just briefly about some bees. Um, we have uh, a lot of challenges with our wild bees here in Florida with over 300 species uh, because of all the spraying of lawns. They live in, in trees, little notches in trees. They don't live in hives like these honeybees do in these big, large hives and they also live in leaf litter. So their homes are constantly under siege with um, whether it's being run over by mowers and or their habitat with leaves are being blown away. Um, and then the chemicals treating the, the ground. So our native bees are under, under siege and it's, uh, they're really important pollinators. They're actually better pollinators than the non-native honeybees. They just don't produce honey, but they live on individually. Um, and most of them don't even have stingers. This is a green sweat bee, which is a pretty common bee to find in gardens. Uh, there, many of them are quite beautiful bees. But just to consideration when you're thinking about raking things away, maybe leave some of that leaf litter um, for these little animals so that they can continue to do their work, which is really important for us. So this is a carpenter bee, another really nice uh, big fuzzy bee. Those will live in small colonies, but not in a hive again. So, I don't know um, how many folks online here have lived in Florida for very long. Um, I've been here my whole life, so I recall love bug season quite well. And depending where you are in Florida, you probably, uh, if you're in, close to an urban area, you're not going to see too many love bugs. I think I counted five this year in our nursery. Um, but it used to be where we would be driving down the street, and by the time you got somewhere, your whole windshield might be covered with insects. And... Um, my parents told me when I started driving, you know, just take a squirt bottle with some water and put a dryer sheet in there and then keep an extra dryer sheet or two with you. And then when you get there, just spray that on there and then wipe it off with the other dryer sheet. And it really works quite well getting rid of the love bugs. Um, 
which is now concerning me to wonder what's in those dryer sheets that it can take love bug junk off of our windows like that, especially once they've been baked on. But this is really, um, when you see the decline between these two windshields, this is really happening to all of our insects and not just butterflies, not just bees, all the beneficial insects are going through this decline. So we, we really need to look at how, we, um, how we're treating our, our landscapes and lawns with chemicals and how we might be able to re reverse some of this. Not that I want love bugs smeared all over my windshield, but I would rather have insects than not have food. And with 90% of our flowering plants pollinated by pollinators, they're pretty darn important. So this is um, the scale of a monarch wing, extremely magnified. And uh, you see it almost looks like roof shingles. This is uh, their system of how they warm their wings and absorb sun and heat because they're cold blooded. Um, but it's a, it's a pretty cool image of, of their scales on the wings. So monarchs are the most studied butterfly in the United States, um, probably arguably in the world. Uh, with over 50 groups in North America alone studying this butterfly. It's uh, the most charismatic and, and uh, looked at butterfly well known. If someone sees an orange butterfly, they're automatically going to say it's a monarch. Um, but this, this butterfly is having a lot of problems. And this is uh, one of the discussions we'll start off with since it is the most popular. This butterfly is found in several different areas um, of, the, of the globe. Uh, with different populations. The most common population that we're gonna know about here or learn about is the migrating population. And there's a lot of confusion about the migrating population and our Florida residential population. So we'll talk about that as well. So these butterflies over about four or five generations, if we talk about the Eastern migration, we'll start off in Mexico. And in the spring, their reproductive organs um, come out of diapause, they breed and head up to the up to the border of Mexico and Texas and lay eggs on the milkweed if everything works well. And timing of that migration um, is very critical to how their population will do that year, whether it's the Western migration or the Eastern migration. So everything, just like with mama bear, everything has to be just right. So if the winter is unseasonably warm for them down in Mexico and they're triggered to leave a little bit too early and the milkweed at the, at the border hasn't really started popping up yet, we're gonna have a much lower population that year. So that's a really big starting point of how the year is gonna go for the monarch butterfly for that season, depending on the timing of the milkweed. If everything goes well and the milkweed has popped up and they have plenty of food, then, then that's usually gonna be a, a much better year for them. And a lot of things are very dependent on, on how that goes. Um, so, and then the second, third and fourth generation make their way up north getting almost to Canada. In a lot of cases they do make to Canada. And then about August, they, um, that fifth generation known as the super monarch, uh, which is a larger monarch than the other four generations will make its way back to Mexico for the most part. Some will overwinter in South Florida, some will make it to Cuba, but for the most part, they, they will make it, the Eastern migration will head to Mexico. And they are in reproductive diapause that time of year. So they won't be breeding, they won't be laying eggs. Um, so anything that's laying eggs past around March or April in your gardens is a resident monarch, not one that migrates. And, you know, there's discussion about um, tropical milkweed that we will discuss in a little bit and why that's, that's a problem, but the migrating monarchs aren't laying eggs. So it has nothing to do with that milkweed being here or not being here because we've always had Asclepias perennis that is an evergreen milkweed, for example that our resident monarchs have had access to throughout the winter months and throughout the year. We have lots of other milkweeds that they can use. But to kind of break down the recent news in July, um, International Union for Conservation of Nature declared the monarch, specifically the migratory monarchs, in, endangered. So that is a distinction and that's talking about the Western migration as well as the Eastern migration of monarchs that migrate. It isn't talking about the Florida residential population that we have here. So it's a very big distinction as to what is being considered endangered. Now, US Fish and Wildlife has not made that distinction here in, our, in the United States. They have indicated back in 2020 that the monarch met all the criteria for being declared endangered, but at that time had other priorities. I'm sure that's tied to money and things like that. Um, 
but they're reviewing it again in 2024 and it's it it's a possibility that the monarch will be declared here endangered at that point but it, again that's discussing the migratory monarchs so this is a, a graph of the population and western population and you can see that it's uh, based on the green bars, it's been declining. There was a big, big scare in 2020 where there was less than 2000 monarchs counted by hundred people um, that that Western population might just disappear. But the following year, things went well and uh, they had rain and the flowers were available, the milkweeds were available, so they had a better food source. So it really shows you between 2018 and 2020 with um, some of those challenges in California with wildfires and, and the drought that those populations dwindled very low during that time. But with but the monarch recovers when it has all of the things that it needs with habitat and, and resources. Average median temperature is also known to be a big factor. Um, when the average median temperature, I think it's about uh, over 72 for the year, when it's much hotter, you will typically see a decline in population as well. So this is the Eastern migration chart. Um, again, where, where you see the dotted green line going across the, the chart, that's, that's when we know if we can stay above that line consistently that the monarchs have rebounded. We're definitely not seeing that um, at this point. And the con the con consistently what we are seeing is the mean going down every, every decade. So there is still a lot of work to be done. There's a lot of work being done. And um, there's a lot of studies being done as to what's causing this. So this was a recent um, release of information that came out of Emory University that has data going back to the 60s on the monarchs. And some of the decline, and this is definitely affecting our Florida population as well, um, causing a lot of illness with our monarchs here locally, uh, which is starting to spread further into the migrating monarchs as well when those breed together. When you look at when Monarch Watch was founded, Journey North was founded in the early early to mid 90s. Uh, that's when there was a lot more information being publicized about the monarch and being made available to people that said, "Hey, the monarch population is is really struggling." The you know and and the fear was put into people, and a lot of gardeners and other people wanted to do something to help. So consequently, what that meant was, well, gardeners wanted to plant more milkweed because they knew that's what fed the monarchs. And, it, and there was no distinction made necessarily between what milkweed should be planted. It was just plant milkweed of any kind. And tropical milkweed became very popular. It was what growers provided to all the retailers to sell. And that, that became the go-to plant because it grew fast and it reseeded fast. Now this milkweed is causing a lot of problems with our wild areas as it does recede very quickly. And in California, most many of the counties have banned it from being sold and declared it an invasive species. Uh, probably will take a while for Florida to do the same thing, but um, they have been making a lot of progress with that in California. In addition to the tropical milkweed introduction, a lot of folks started rearing monarchs thinking that that was going to help the population. Well, it, it really doesn't increase the population as studies have found. And typically what it does is it creates a lot of stress on the butterflies, the caterpillars, they're reared in, in conditions that are not necessarily ideal, certainly not in a wild setting where they can find the resources they want. And there's many things we don't even understand uh, that, the, that the butterflies use and that the caterpillars use. So um, it introduces the disease and it spreads the disease at a much faster rate. And then Facebook was launched and consequently that just spread this even more with lots of rearing groups encouraging that, that type of behavior um, with the home rearing and the milkweed. So it's really a situation where we're loving the monarch to death and what they really need is wild native habitat and lots of it. So OE is a disease, it's a naturally occurring parasite similar to red tide being a naturally occurring phenomenon in our water systems. and with red tide becoming a lot worse with the fertilization, um, all the fertilizers getting into the water systems. Consequently, this OE parasite is now exacerbated by the introduction of the OE, or, I mean, of the tropical milkweed, as well as the home rearing combination. So tropical milkweed doesn't have the same defense mechanisms, being a non-native species that's introduced to our state as our other milkweeds do. 
wall OE is definitely uh, something that monarchs have always had, but it's been more at a low level, like one in 200 butterflies. It isn't at the levels that we're seeing now. In Central Florida, we're seeing an OE, OE rise to about 80 to 90% in the studies that we've been doing over the last 10 years. And in South Florida, it's been at 100%. So this has really become a big problem for our state, for our resident butterflies, um, the spread of this disease. And unfortunately, with, with the tropical milkweed not being able to fight off the spores, the spores reproduce much quickly on that milkweed. And then the butterflies, when they're laying their eggs or they're touching that milkweed, they're spreading it. And it spreads very quickly. It does start with the butterfly, but it, it spreads through the plant. So... Um, on the image there on the left, upper left, the where you see the little square on those little dots, the little dots are, and, and depending on what kind of microscope you're using, they look like salt and pepper. And monarchs can have a low level of OE or a very heavy level. And just because they emerge with crinkled wings doesn't indicate that they have OE for sure without being tested. You really cannot see this disease unless you're looking at the spores under a microscope and testing the butterflies. So I have, we have seen butterflies that look extremely strong, very strong wings, and they were fully loaded with OE. I've, we've tested some that were emerged with crinkled wings and they had no OE present. So it really just depends, you really have to see the spores under a microscope. That's the only way to determine it for sure. But at this point, many of our monarchs are just pretty sick. So replacing milkweeds to the native species is, is the best option, providing a lot of nectar resources is what they need. So here, you know, this is a very difficult conversation with a lot of folks, but, but it is a, a seed to plant and for people to start considering what they're doing and how, they're, how best to help the monarch. And best is wild and best is native plants for them. So one of the things I did when I looked at the migrating monarchs initially several years ago, is I Googled this um, information about how far has the farthest monarch traveled, or how's, what is the longest, longest distance a monarch has traveled? And Google comes back with, with this great answer of 40 million miles. And I was really expecting something like two to 3,000 miles between Canada and Mexico. And so in a lot of this other information, which was pretty far out there. So what happened is uh, University of Kansas and Monarch Watch sent three caterpillars up. I think one was a fourth end star and two were fifth end star with some space caterpillar food. They didn't go up with milkweed and they really wanted to see if the caterpillars would complete metamorphosis and they all did. Um, so they went up in the space shuttle in November of I think it was 2009. No, that doesn't sound right. Much earlier than that. I'd have to look the date up again. Um, and it was a big camp, big um, education point for kids in schools to watch this. Uh, there is some videos you can look up on C-SPAN and see, you know, the butterflies and the emerging and also trying to fly in outer space where they weren't going anywhere. They were <laughs> kind of stationary, um, probably very confusing for them because they do have brains and um, it's, it's confusing enough to go from caterpillar to butterfly, but then when you can't fly when you're trying to. And you see there's an awful lot of uh, their debris in the, in the chamber that they were being kept in, but they all emerged and they're all on display at University of Kansas forever. Um, the, some of the results were their wings were a little bit more dehydrated and they were a little bit smaller, but um, otherwise they, they emerged and everything went fine with, uh, with their metamorphosis being completed. So um, some of the other threats uh, we talked about temperature and climate change a little bit earlier. Farming is a really big um, component of threats for monarchs and the, the migrating monarchs. Um, loss of host, host plants due to um, you know, the farmlands being really uh, densely planted now and all this overhead spraying where uh, in between the crops previously uh, used to be the milkweeds growing there. Now there's no room for the milkweeds to grow. So consequently between the spraying and loss of habitat, there, that's a, another big problem for the, um, for the monarch population. So there's some groups that have been working on that with farmers. Uh, obviously they're trying to feed the human race. So their, their goal is to provide the biggest yield uh, of crops. So they didn't realize this was a, such a big deal um, for, for bugs and, and specifically the monarch. So now a lot of the perimeters of their properties are being, um, being planted with, mil with um, milkweed and monarch food. 
uh, nectar plants and such. So that's hopefully um, we're starting to see that that's making an impact in a positive way. Logging in Mexico, while it is illegal, is still continuing. People will go in the middle of the night and, um, you know, for agricultural purposes, they want those avocados, of course. Um, but unfortunately, this is reducing the overwintering habitat for the monarchs in Mexico. So um, manicured lawns, we've kind of talked about, um, and pesticides, of course. Uh, wasps, wasps are one of the predators of monarchs. Uh, they're they're plant protectors. They're trying to protect the plant, but they're kind of an important component of the whole ecosystem. They're very good pollinators, and it's an important management for managing uh, the caterpillar population, kind of a survival of the fittest thing. Spiders, you know, will sneak up and, and grab, grab a butterfly sometimes, but humans really are the biggest threat to the monarch population overall. So the monarch life cycle is typically it can be 20 to 30 days is pretty standard, but in the winter months, they slow down, especially when it gets a little colder for a few days, they will slow down significantly and it can take up to 45 days for them to go through their full life cycle. And in the winter months, your caterpillars will often, as you're looking at them, take a darker form. There'll be a lot more black to hold in the heat. And um, in, the winter, in the summertime, they're gonna be a lot more white in form and that's to release the heat so they can control their temperature. So that's one of the ways they do that since they're cold-blooded as caterpillars. And the gold rim on a monarch, um, kind of a neat thing, but this is the oxygen. These are oxygen ports for the caterpillars that's going through metamorphosis to a butterfly and how, how the oxygen gets into the chrysalis chamber. And this was discovered by Dr. Stringer in 2012. So this was pretty cool, um, pretty cool stuff that he did with the, with the nanotechnology and scans to find this out and looking at the chrysalis throughout the day, several different chrysalis species, but the monarch was the specific one he looked at for this study. But all, all chrysalis have this mechanism. It may not be quite as stunning as the jewel looking uh, monarch chrysalis, but they all have these kind of mechanisms for the oxygen ports. The easiest way to tell the difference between a male and female, uh, the top butterfly is a male where the green arrows are pointing to the pheromone spots on the hind wings. That's the easiest way to tell the difference between a male and a female, especially if they're in flight. Even if the wings are closed, you can typically see those uh, pheromone spots. And, um, and females can lay uh, over 300 eggs. So each one is laying an awful lot of eggs during her lifetime. And out of the number of eggs, only two to eight should actually make it to adulthood. And that's normal in the insect order. They lay an awful lot of eggs. And most of those um, caterpillars are known to be food, whether it's the monarch or any other species, because the birds are eating it and other predators are eating, and it goes on from there up the food chain. So they're a really important food source. Um, we'll still have monarchs, even if only two to eight of those make it, their reproduction is, um, is pretty, uh, pretty strong. And another way we get most of our um, butterflies are coming from breeders. We get pupa from them for our education facility here. And the breeders keep the females typically and a few males um, for continuing their, their breeding stock. And how they know that to send me the females is on the left, you'll see, and I can't really point to this the way we are doing this uh, online, but the segment, um, between the two big dots, there's a line that goes all the way from one segment of the chrysalis to the other. And, and on the right side, you see a tiny dot there in between those bigger dots. And that's a male and that will be present or not present, could be gone completely. And that's how they can tell the difference while in chrysalis that, between a male and a female. So in Florida, we have over 21 species of milkweeds and commercially available, I would say there's about five. And we also have six species of milk vines, which the monarch isn't so um, interested in laying eggs on milk vines, typically speaking, they will do it and they will definitely eat it as a food source, um, provides the same, same production that the milkweeds do. Um, we typically can find one or two of those species at native nurseries um, in the state of Florida. And they're they're also a good food source for them when the milkweed, the leafy milkweeds are all stripped bare. But the picture on the left, that's a, our, our native milkweed is Asclepias perennis that is evergreen here um, in my yard that's blooming off and on throughout the year after blooms. 
uh, we get seed pods and I'm able to reproduce a lot more plants. It only gets to be about two feet tall. Um, even though it has the name aquatic and the common name, it will grow in the sun all the way to uh, full shade. It will also um, tolerate drought time of year as well as the rainy season. So it pretty much is a plant that handles everything Florida throws at it. It happens to be my favorite milkweed because it, it's a lot more versatile than the others. And even though it only gets to be about two feet tall and the leaves aren't quite as large as people are used to seeing on maybe tropical milkweed or pink swamp milkweed, it does feed the monarchs and fill them up quite well. And then pink swamp milkweed on the right-hand side, this is one that is typically seen between late February through mid, mid to late November. It is starting to go dormant right now. Uh, when it does go dormant, if it's something you're planted in your yard, you just leave the sticks, cut it back to about six inches and uh, the plant re pushes back up from the roots in the spring. So it's not dead, it's just dormant. And this is a plant that can get up to about four feet tall. So it is a very popular one. Uh, for a lot of people because it does get a lot larger. And butterfly weed on the left that blooms orange, tuberosa, has a very, uh, is a, has a tuber root. So it, when it goes dormant, you won't see even a stick above ground, but it will push up from those tuber roots in the spring. It likes to be very dry. Um, it is a plant where you water, you know, need to water to establish lightly, but if you overwater this plant, you will definitely kill it. It likes to be in dry conditions. On the milkweed on the bottom right is world milkweed. The leaves are very thin and small, but it does again feed the monarch quite well, even though the leaves don't look like they would. And this one in my garden um, in Tampa seems to be evergreen because it's growing all year, but I'm not sure if that's the case up in, in North Florida. And this is the one of the native milk vines that when it blooms, the whole stems are in bloom and it's quite a pollinator magnet. All kinds of things will be attracted to it. So it's pretty, it's, it's a pretty neat plant. Um, it is a very fast growing plant. So it does need a little bit of help um, if you're gonna grow it on a trellis or grow it. I grow it at, at home in a pot and I have a trellis that I can continually uh, wrap it or take from cuttings. You can root it from cuttings, uh, but it grows about a foot a week in, in, in our area in central Florida. But again, it's another plant that you, the monarchs will eat it. And um, the queen butterfly is very attracted to laying eggs on it. So that's another butterfly you can attract to your yard if you've got this plant. Of course, there's corky stem and some other things mixed on this uh, trellis in this garden. So a little bit about uh, mimicry, which is a very common thing in a lot of wildlife. The butterfly on the left is a queen butterfly, more of a root beer color, a little bit smaller than a monarch. And the chrysalis looks like a monarch chrysalis, but it is a smaller chrysalis in size. But the, in the butterfly on the right is a viceroy. So the common way we look at that, it looks very similar to the monarch in color. The flight patterns are very different with these different butterflies. So when we're out in the field counting butterflies, if we see an orange butterfly, sometimes if you can't get a good enough look at it, you look at the flight pattern. Uh, monarch is being as charismatic as it is, has what we call a flap flap glide flight pattern or flap flap look at me. Um, and that's definitely how you can identify a monarch, whereas the Gulf, or excuse me, the uh, Viceroy on the right hand side has a constant flapping motion. Its uh, wings are constantly moving and it doesn't really glide. And the way you can tell the difference between the Viceroy and the monarch is the smile line on the hind wing of the Viceroy whether the wings are folded or or out that you can fold it out flat, you can definitely see this line. And that's actually the one that's on the license tag for Florida wildflower um, versus the monarch. A lot of people think that the, the butterfly that's on the license tag is actually is a monarch, but it's, it's a viceroy. So the viceroy doesn't have the same toxic effect for birds as a monarch does or the queen does. Monarchs and queens eat milkweed and that uh, the glycosides and the milky sap give it protection against some predators. Most birds, if they eat a monarch or a queen, it'll make them sick. It won't kill them, but they won't ever eat another orange butterfly again. So, and but you know, again, when they see the viceroy, they can't, they don't necessarily see that smile line. So they think that the viceroy is off limits as well if they've eaten an orange butterfly before. And the vice the viceroy is found in a lot of coastal areas. So are monarchs and queens. So they can be in the same habitat areas. Um, but the viceroy's host plant is coastal willow. 
So I'm not going to get too deep into the invasive plant species, but as uh, gardeners, one of the things that people are very surprised about is in, that lantana, the non-native lantana, is, is in the top 10 of invasive, invasive plant species in Florida. And I've seen them where the plants get so large, they take over orange trees and groves. And birds, of course, it is a very popular plant for pollinators. However, birds spread it very quickly and it is extremely invasive. And you know, if you've got the non-native for sure, when you've got multicolored plants or you've got lavenders, things like that. Um, there are two native species in South Florida, the Rockland and Pineland lantanas. Uh, and in, in the Central Florida, uh, we have uh, button sage lantana that's very popular. Uh, it's a pink, little pink flower. Um, some of the growers are producing what they're calling um, sterile plants now for, for lantana, which is kind of defeating the purpose of helping pollinators if you're gonna be doing that, but at least it doesn't produce berries, but it also reduces the nectar load on the plants. So buying native is, is really more important and it saves our state a lot of money by not having all these invasives. They're constantly having to fight. We have just a really big problem in Florida with invasive species. And uh, one of these days we may find that the Asclepius curasavica, which is tropical milkweed, will be on that list of invasive, invasive species. They go by many different common names. So you really have to, if you're trying to stay away from the non-native tropical milkweed, you have to look at the scientific name on tags. And if they don't have it tagged at a nursery, then chances are it is tropical milkweed. But they'll call it blood flower, they'll call it scarlet milkweed, they'd give it all kinds of fancy names. I've even seen it called butterfly weed, which is the common name for our Asclepius tuberosa, which is native. So you just have to be very mindful of what you're purchasing if you're trying to stay away from the non-native species. So really, really important um, is just planting more nectar. Uh, also for the butterflies, if you want to, you need to feed them with the host plants, but you also need to feed the adults um, with nectar. So the more nectar you have and a variety of nectar, the more species you're gonna attract into your garden. So this is actually a, up in Tallahassee, a couple that has a big farm. It used to be a dairy farm and they converted it when they bought it to 100% for pollinators and it backs up to a really nice preserve. So this habitat is pretty tremendous. I think we had over 70 species of butterflies the day we counted butterflies there. So pretty, pretty phenomenal for a 20 acre meadow to look like this. And the flowers, most of them were almost as, as tall as I am about, you know, I'm five foot nine. So you don't really see people when you're walking through here. You just see all the creatures, which is pretty cool. Another, one of the, one of the ways you can help aside from planting, um, planting native is also um, working with Monarch Way Station uh, or Monarch Watch getting the way station sign or like here we have the Tampa Bay Butterfly Foundation garden sign and I know NABA has a certification sign but just putting a sign up telling people what you're doing so when they look at your garden they don't necessarily see something that's just a, a you know a lot of people say it's a bunch of weeds but that there's a purpose to what you're planting um, and there's all kinds of different um, guides on how to, you know, what to plant and in combinations. And monarchs, you know, and other butterflies, they need they need grasses to places to hide and to, you know, put their hang their chrysalis. So putting these grasses in, you know, it, it adds interest to your garden and it also adds um, critical habitat for for them. So when they go looking for a place, they don't have to go looking quite so far, and they will go very far to find a place to hang, in, in the absence of. Uh, you know, bushes and trees and things. One of the things that NABA in conjunction with a, a group called Monarchs in the Rough, they got a two-year grant from 2018 to 2020, started working on all the golf courses uh, in North America and Canada, and also Central, Central America as well, trying to get more of the habitat put in for pollinators in the rough areas. And there was quite a bit of success um, all around uh, these areas. Every golf course that existed got a packet. And sadly, Florida didn't do so hot considering we have, I believe the most golf courses in the States uh, for any state, but there's, so there's an awful lot of opportunity to go for these golf courses and see if there's more that can be done and uh, on an individual group basis and getting some more habitat put in, into these uh, properties. There's a lot of green space and golf courses, as you know, and it's uh, really attractive if you're playing golf 
to see that plus the pollinators benefit. So it's an opportunity um, to continue working on that now that that grant's over. Maybe some of the groups um, that might be listening on here can, uh, can go after one of the golf courses in their area and see what they can do to make progress. So let's change over and talk about a few other butterflies you might be able to attract to your yard. And one thing to note is the butterflies range in all different sizes. And we talked about the queen, that's about half the size of a dollar bill. And when I mentioned uh, the citrus earlier, um, the giant swallowtail, the largest butterfly in North America, the wingspan can be up to the full length of a dollar bill. Um, they can be smaller, but they're, they're typically pretty large butterflies. And they can be as small as a dime size or even smaller than a dime. Uh, if you're talking about the Eastern or Western pygmy blues that we see here in our state, um, that's a, a Cassius blue in that picture. And metal marks that love the purple thistles, that's um, about the size of a nickel and several of the hair streaks are size of a quarter. So they range in size. And then butterflies, skippers and moths, when we're looking at differences between them, um, butterflies have clubs, clubbed antennas. They emerge from a chrysalis. They're solar powered. Uh, they can fly on a, a cloudy day if the temperatures and humidity are right, but um, they're gonna be in much bigger numbers when it's sunny outside. And when they land on a flower, their wings are gonna be folded. And then skippers have curved antennas. They actually share some features of moths as well as butterflies, but they're categorized as butterflies um, because they're day flyers. And uh, when they pupate, they pupate in what looks like a, a cocoon, which is what a moth would emerge from. So moths have more feathery antennas and, and, and plumy antennas. They emerge from a cocoon. Most moths are nocturnal, but there's several day flying species. But when they land, they're gonna land flat um, like they would under uh, around your um, you know, lights outside. If you've got lights outside in your front porch or something, you're gonna land flat on the wall. Or if you're walking through a field and you see something flying and it disappears under a blade of grass or a leaf, that's typically a moth because butterflies are gonna stay on top of the flowers or on top of the plants. And this is a luna moth, commonly seen in the, if you're out in the middle of the night <laughs> in some of the woody areas, uh, like sweet gum as a, a native host plant, sweet gum trees, but a very, very beautiful moth here in our state. I mentioned Danny sulfur butterfly earlier that uses the host plant Biden's alba, the Spanish needles. So that's an image of that butterfly and it's most noted. Um, it's about the size of a nickel and it spots those two spots on its upper wing is how you would tell it apart from a, other sulfur butterflies that are its size, same size. Another plant, um, pepperweed is another plant that's very commonly pulled out of the landscapes. Uh, it's actually an edible for us and the, when the when the seeds are green, it's got a little bit of a pepper flavor. And when they start to turn brown and red, they're going to seed, but it's a host plant for the great Southern white butterfly. The male is the bright white butterfly on the upper left with the aqua clubbed antennas. And the female is a little bit more of a grayish brown. But if you wanna attract those guys to your yard, you wanna definitely have some pepperweed. An American lady, this one is, um, a little bit smaller than a queen butterfly, has little white clubbed antennas, and her native host plant is, is what is called native cudweed. These weeds have terrible names, really need to maybe just reduce, get rid of the word weed, and that will help our, our native species. But what they do, the caterpillar um, actually will use the top of that, what is a flower on the cudweed, and it will wrap itself in what almost looks like a spitball to protect itself, and it will blend in to those flowers um, while it's eating the plant. But this is a, one of those plants that's often pulled out and evicted out of landscapes as being you know, a weed nobody wants, but this butterfly depends on it. Cassius blue, we talked about a little while ago as being a, about a dime-sized butterfly. It's uh, noted with the two eye spots on the hind wings and it likes our, whether you say it plumbago or plumbago, the native wild um, plumbago is its um, host plant. It will also use the non-native um, lavender blooming plumbago as well. Passion vines are really popular. They're very stunning flowers. Uh, Maypop is, is a really nice one to attract our long wing butterflies. Um, my favorite though is the, is the corky stem passion vine. It has a, a dime sized flower, very small passion flower. But the reason it's my favorite is again, versatility. Similar to the aquatic milkweed we talked about earlier, this plant grows in the sun or the shade and everything in between. Um, it has leaves that look a little like English ivy, um, but way better since it's not an invasive plant. It's a native to our area, 
the purple berries feed the birds, the plant feeds caterpillars. Um, it grows in the shade, in the sun. I use it as a spiller plant. I can put it in hanging baskets. I've also used it as a ground cover. So it really um, can, can be very versatile in the landscape and provide an awful lot of food for many different things. Uh, these are the four um, long-winged butterflies. The zebra longwing is actually the state butterfly for Florida. So it's a shady butterfly. So when corky stem is in a shadier location, you might find the zebra longwing there, whereas the Gulf fritillary likes it hot. So if that plant's planted in the heat, that's where you might find its caterpillars. Uh, Julia's are only found as usually as far north as Apollo Beach, which is central Florida. Variegated fr fritillaries are um, not really common in garden settings, more out in woody settings, but it is popular. It is possible to see them throughout Florida. And black swallowtails, if you have herbs in your garden like fennel, parsley, dill, chances are you've had these caterpillars. They start off in the first, second, and third and start looking like a bird dropping a black caterpillar with a white band in the middle. And then the fourth and fifth and star, they start looking more like a monarch um, caterpillar which is one of its defense mechanisms for giving it some protection because these caterpillars are very tasty and edible to birds. So by that protection, sometimes these caterpillars are spared because they do resemble a monarch caterpillar, which again is toxic if a bird eats it, uh, will make them sick. So monarchs are toxic from start to finish for most bird species. But native species for this butterfly, the black swallowtail or mock, mock bishop's weed, water dropwort and golden alexander. But these are stunning butterflies. The middle, um, the butterfly in the bottom middle is a female and the one on the right with more yellow is the male. And I just talked about the mimicry between the two. A bird really can't see the difference between these, um, these caterpillars. So it usually will stay away from them if it's eaten in a monarch first, which is kind of a neat, neat defense mechanism. And frog fruit, uh, Phyla notiflora is a very popular plant. Uh, a lot of people at our nursery buy this plant for ground cover areas. This is a nice looking uh, landscape that uh, where they did the whole yard in frog fruit. They mow it once a year and it's edged about every six to eight weeks. So a lot less maintenance, plus you can attract these three butterflies to your landscape. So it's a very popular plant. It's evergreen, uh, produces cute little white, um, white flowers with a purple center, but you get a lot more movement and other pollinators use it as a nectar source too, especially skippers. And cloudless and orange barred sulfurs, um, their caterpillars can range in color from yellow to green. And typically what I have seen is if the egg starts off on a yellow flower, the caterpillar takes a yellow form. And if it starts off on the green leaf, the caterpillar tends to take a green form. And again, this is another defense mechanism for this butterfly as it's in its caterpillar phase. And the cloudless sulfur, the one on the left, is the one you're usually going to see flying really fast, and it looks like it's late for somewhere, and it doesn't really stop too often. But um, And then the butterfly on the right is the orange barred sulfur, which is much larger. It tends to hang around the garden a lot longer if you have the cassia plants. And this one's laying an egg right now, and you can kind of see some eggs on the other leaves there in that image. Uh, pipe vine and polydomus swallowtails, they need uh, native host plants. So uh, Dutchman's pipe vine. The tomentosa is the native one that, that the one on the left, if, uh, if it actually is using uh, non-native pipe vine to lay its eggs on, it is typically toxic to its caterpillars and will kill the caterpillars. The butterfly on the right is not as picky. It will take, um, it will eat any pipe vine that you give it and it does just fine with that. That's the polydomus swallowtail. It's the only swallowtail in North America without tails. Um, you can see the red on its body and, and red slashes on its hind wings, which you, you know, one of its distinguishing features. It's also known as the gold rim butterfly because the whole inside of its hind wings have the gold, have the gold yellow markings. But these butterflies are very easy to attract your garden if you have the native pipe vine. Giant swallowtail, we've talked about a couple times. Other host plants are Hercules club and non-native rue that will attract this butterfly as well as the citrus. And then last but not least, our keystone species are the oaks. With, uh, I think we have over 90 species so far documented that the oak tree provides as a host plant for both um, moths and butterflies in our state. So it's a huge, huge resource for food for birds and other animals with all those caterpillars. Um, very important plant to our state overall. 
with hurricanes and uh, you know these these big huge canopies really break the winds. Sometimes it breaks the tree, but at least you know that tree stopped the winds from uh, taking out something else. Hopefully, it's a very important plant, being a keystone species and providing wild uh, food for so many different wildlife species. Some of the uh, butterflies that, that do host on it, a common one that can be found in gardens with oak trees around, red banded hair streak. The banded hair streak, the white M and the striped hair streak are typically not gonna come out of the trees too much. Um, very, very uncommon to see in garden settings, but if you're going through park areas, you might find those um, butterflies coming down for some nectar. Horace's dusky wing on the left is a skipper. You see the curvy antenna. That's a very common butterfly in your garden. A lot of people think it's a moth because it's sort of brown and sort of mottled coloring, but it is a skipper and um, very commonly seen in, in gardens. And up and if you're north of, probably north of Dade City, you might see the morning cloak, which is a really pretty butterfly up there that hosts on oaks and also the Edwards hair streak. So those are a few of the species that you might find. So everything has a purpose. And, in our, and it's really our responsibility to kind of learn about these things. What is this animal doing and what, what is it providing for? Um, ants have symbiotic relationships with a lot of caterpillars where they go around getting the sugars after the caterpillars are eating leaves. So there's just an awful lot of things that just work together. Uh, a lot of people have a war on aphids. Aphids actually protect monarch caterpillars in the first and second instar by providing camouflage for them as they're eating a little bit of the nectar, eating a little bit of the sap out of the plant, it tricks, uh, tr tricks predators into thinking that's the food source and that's what they'll go after and won't be able to, in a lot of cases, find that little tiny first or second instar monarch. So there's a lot of things that work together in, in our ecosystem. And it's, uh, it's pretty fascinating when you learn how, how, things, how things are designed. Nature really knew what she was doing. This is up at uh, St. Mark's. This was a lot of Gulf fritillaries that were migrating. Um, there were some monarchs there too that day, as well as some, some long tail skippers. So pretty, pretty cool place if you wanna see the migration. Other areas in Florida in the fall, you might see the migration. Fort DeSoto sometimes uh, will have some of the migrators. Uh, Cedar Key is another popular spot. Of course, this time of year, I think they've probably left Florida and um, have moved on, but in the future, you might be able to see them in those spots. I wanna thank everybody for, for visiting today and certainly happy to take any questions if I know we're kind of a couple minutes after the hour, but I'm still happy to take questions if anybody has them. Great, thank you so much, Anita. Um, yes, we have a few questions. Um, uh, let's see, we, there are a lot of posts about cutting back tropical milkweed seasonally. Does that only help with the migratory activity, but still carry the OE risk? The OE risk is still going to be there. Um, cutting it back, the, you know, like I said, the, the monarchs that are migrating in the fall, they're not laying eggs. So it really doesn't impact the migrators from that standpoint. Um, they're not looking for milkweed in the fall. They're looking for roosting spots and nectar. So the most important thing for migrating monarchs in the fall is to have lots of fall nectar things, you know, like your golden rods, blazing stars, salt bush, Florida privet, a lot of things that bloom in the fall. That's really what's important for the migrators in the fall. Um, people, most people will say, if you're gonna have this tropical milkweed, you should really be cutting it back on a regular basis um, in between each, each brood. Some people will go to the extent of bleaching it um, with a, a 10 or 15% bleach solution and rinsing it after that. Um, before it flushes out to finish killing off some of the spores, but the spores still reproduce very quickly on that plant regardless of time of year. So it's really mostly, imp it's impacting our resident monarch population the most. Great, thank you. Um, let's see, does the native milkweed spread? Up in the north, it, the pink milkweed does spread quite a bit. What about the native ones here? Well, I know Perennis, um, does. We've seen that out in the field um, when it, and it goes to seed pod throughout the year here in Tampa anyway. Um, so it does spread on some of the sites that we've monitored. Um, I wouldn't say it spreads extremely quickly, um, but it does spread to some extent. Can you describe the flight pattern of the queen butterfly? It's more of a constant flapping, but a little bit, um, I would say it's not rapid, but it's not really a gliding pattern either. It's just kind of a constant um, motion, so. 
Okay. They just don't glide. <laughs> <laughs> um, someone's asking a question about the white twine vine. Uh, the iguanas seem to love it. Um, is it something that you can cut back? This yes. is uh, from Broward in Miami-Dade County. Yeah, you definitely can cut it back. It'll come right back. It's a, it's a very strong plant. So it's interesting that iguanas like it. Hmm. I was in South Florida for an event recently and I, the most questions came about iguanas and how what plants do they not like? It seems like they're pretty uh, non-specific non in what they like to eat. Yeah, kind of like chickens. <laughs> <laughs> Um, someone asked about the non-native lantana. They have it and they have butterflies, lizards, and lots of birds. Is there a better time of year to transition from a non-native to a native plant? No, I mean, in Florida, especially, I don't know about North Florida as much as I do Central Florida, but in Central Florida, I plant here year round. Um, fall is my favorite time to plant because it gives plants a lot more opportunity to get more established before the spring drought time of year. Um, and the roots are much stronger. So when you've got a lot of pollinators in the spring, you're gonna have a lot more blooms. At least that's what I experience here. So I, I plant any time of year, unless it's, unless it's 30 degrees or below. <laughs> that's the only day I don't plant. <laughs> um, okay, just a couple more questions if you don't mind. Um, is it true that home reared monarchs do not migrate? No, not necessarily. Uh, we have had a few, um, few. well, I'll call it, they were reared by professional breeders. There were a few that were found tagged that made it to Mexico. Interesting. Um, can you say something about the Shouse's swallowtail? Nope, it looks like she froze up. Well, that might be a good time to um, cut this off. I apologize. It looks like there's some technical difficulties freezing that uh, freezing up for her. Um, we will record your questions and um, get them passed on to Anita and um, hope to get some answers to some of you um, soon. So the recording will be sent out uh, in the next day or so when it's ready. Um, and again, if you like this presentation and uh, the other um, Presentation says we've offered, please consider becoming a member, um, donating or purchasing the state wildflower license plate. Thank you.